Seated. We are excited to be Good morning. back with you this morning. Um, we are want to introduce ourselves again in case you weren't here for our first Confident Parenting Seminar. We are uh, Sarah and Tommy Patrick. We have been married 26 years. In a row. We, this week, actually. Yes. Woo! Yes. June 5th. Uh, we have three kids uh, that we adore. They are all here today, uh, but I believe we have a picture of them. Uh, do you have the clicker? Are you doing the slides? There you go. We have a picture of them. Oh. Next one. Nope, that's not it. All right, we'll put a picture of them up later. We have three kids. Gracie is 23, Lucy is 21, and Keith is 18. They all just had birthdays. We just finished birthday marathon in our family in the spring, February to May, all five of our birthdays fall. And so we just finished that, so we're all freshly older. But we're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> so because, this is good. But they all are graduating from something this year, and we have two graduations next week, along with our anniversary. So, yes. woohoo! This is good. So, <laughs> so we have uh, between the two of us a collective amount of experience when it comes to working with kids. Of course, we have our own, but also working with uh, with students and children. Pretty much in the last. 30 years we've worked with uh, anywhere from infants all the way through high school age, whether we've been life group leaders or in our professions in ministry or in volunteer capacity. And so we are excited to be able to bring that experience in addition to our training to you today. Yeah, so uh, I am the director of guest operations for uh, Pine Valley Bible Conference Center up in Pine Valley. Uh, aside from that, I'm also a uh, part-time high school football referee. Uh, but before that, like Sarah said, you know, we've had years of, uh, I was a volunteer in youth ministry and a youth worker. I've been a teacher, and uh, I've also had a 15-year career working for Southwest Airlines. Uh, we've been with uh, children pretty much 24-7, 365 for the last... 23 uh, years. 23 years. <laughs> yes, 23 years. So, uh, but we are both certified Homeward trainers. Homeward is an organization that is geared towards helping families succeed. Uh, they have uh, the training that we're going through. They have 12 seminars just focusing on the health and well-being of families, everything from children to marriages to uh, a fam the family nucleus. So we're really excited to uh, share this uh, training with you today. So this subject today is uh, on teaching our kids healthy sexuality. Yeah, our kids need someone in their life who is unashamed to be Christian and also totally open to talking about sexuality with them. They need honest input to answer their questions that they might have. We live in a world that is filled with sexual innuendos and unhealthy conversations, and this is an opportunity for us to turn that into a healthy conversation. And we want to dive into that today. The more value-centered conversations they have at home um, and with their family, the better off they Will be as they navigate the world outside. All right. So let's uh, start off of the bat that this will be, <laughs> these will be very awkward conversations, right? <laughs> that, that, that we can't get around that. But hopefully, as you progress, uh, as they get older, that the more conversations you have, the less awkward it will be. It'll still be awkward, but, be, but hopefully, it'll be less and you'll be more comfortable with it. Now, just if you're brave enough, and I understand uh, you, you may not be. A show of hands, how many of you ever had a conversation with your parents about sex? Now, if, you, if they're here, it's okay not to raise your hand. My so. parents are in the room, so I'm going to say yes. Oh, mine are not, so I can, <laughs> but I can say no. Okay? So, you know, uh, not a lot of hands. So, let me ask you, of those of you who raised your hands, how many would you describe that conversation as positive, uh, maybe not awkward? Or, uh, or even healthy. Okay, no one can put their hands yeah. up because they were always awkward. Yes, they were always awkward. So you're going to, yeah, <laughs> one of those things. Um, well, that's the reason that we're here today is because we want to make sure we initiate those conversations at home. We want to create, may, hopefully they'll be less awkward as we go along. And we can honestly say that we, we find them awkward as well. In spite of being here today and having practiced having them over and over and over again with our own kids, but then even just we, we would have them just together to be able to practice having them, it still can be uncomfortable, but we believe we can get further along. And because we value our kids having the best 
chances towards um, healthy relationships for themselves in the future, that's why we're here today, and that's what we want to do. Right. So we're going to uh, acknowledge that there are a lot of reasons why we don't have these conversations. Uh, one of the reasons is sometimes we often don't feel equipped as parents to have these conversations. Uh, we didn't get a talk or, or a conversation with our parents about it, so we're really, really not ready to talk about that with our kids. Another reason is sometimes uh, we have pains, hurts, mm -hmm. and regrets from our past that we maybe we still haven't dealt with or really haven't um, kind of cleared the air about that a little bit. So we're, again, we're not just ready and feel um, ready to kind of relive that pain again. Another reason, sometimes we're just afraid of the questions that our kids might ask. You know, questions like, did you have sex before marriage? You know, if we're not ready to answer that question, then yeah, sometimes we just want to avoid those conversations. And the last one is sometimes we just have these false assumptions in our heads that if I start talking about this with my kid, they're going to actually go out and start having sex. They're going to use that as permission to go out and have sex. And that's not uh, the point at all. The point is, by having these conversations, we're not only protecting our kids, we're actually preparing them for a healthy life life choices. Yeah. I was reading uh, the, uh, some scripture this morning, and I wanted to just share this super quick, because I really thought, as our own stories get woven into trying to do this seminar today, we will hear this in two ways. We will hear, oh man, I did this well, or oh, I really messed this up in my life, and we can shut down what we're hearing. And we also have the context of, we want to make sure we give the best to our kids. And so this um, is what I read this morning. I thought it totally applies but it says here, Psalm 103, verse 10, starting with verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made, he remembers that we are dust. And I just thought, what a beautiful thing to remember, that, that when we ask God to forgive us of our stuff, he does. He removes those transgressions from us. So we can move forward, regardless of what our stories are, and walk confidently with our kids to help them have the best life possible as well. So I just wanted to offer that up today as we move into it because the bottom line for today is that we want to help develop healthy sexuality that honors God, family, future spouse, and themselves. Let me say that again. We're trying to honor God, our family, a future spouse, and ourselves. And that's why we're encouraging a uh, commitment to a life of sexual purity, of sexual integrity. It's often referred to as the purity code or the sexual integrity code. I don't really do code words so much or live by codes, but I do have goals in my life. And so as we go throughout our seminar today, this is supposed to be tools that you can use within your own families as you create your, goal, your values and your goals within your family for yourself and for your kids. I have a tendency to say, wow, my goal in life is to live a life of sexual integrity. What does that look like for me? How can that honor God? How can that honor my family? How can that honor Tommy, because we are married, and how can that be honoring of myself? And so that's the way in which we go about this. That's our goal. Yeah, so on your table are, is some uh, handouts. You're welcome to take one. Uh, you take some yes. notes in it. We'll uh, go through that entire book today. The margin, the blue margins on the right are just kind of for something for you to talk about, think about uh, later on. We won't actually go into those. But you're welcome, you'll take these with you and uh, make some notes however you, uh, as it comes along. So we believe, especially through Homeward, that the, the purity code is a more relational and healthy approach to sexuality. It's a more a positive view of not only yourself, but also how to relate to the opposite sex. Uh, we are not, it's not just pushing abstinence from inter sexual intercourse, which is, you know, as parents, is kind of what we want for our kids. Mm -hmm. But we find that if abstinence is the only thing we're pushing without any sort of conversation or a dialogue, then it, be, then it, be, it becomes uh, our children kind of look at it as, as a legalistic about this topic. They, be, they start asking questions like, well, how far can I go before I go too far? How far is too far? Can I do this and still be pure? And then, and then the study will, will show that kids will sometimes get themselves into situations where they're compromising their values just so they can abstain. And we don't want to do that. We would, uh, 
It's just like a few, a few decades ago, they had that <laughs> just say no to drugs campaign. Well, if, if, just, if all we said was just say no, and we didn't follow that up with like the dangers of tobacco and, and smoking and, and vaping nowadays, then it just becomes a rule, one of those don't do it because I said so rule. And of course, rules are just meant to be broken in, in the minds of kids. Yeah, we're gonna go through some, some information today and give you some statistics that can actually be staggering. One of those being that studies show that most kids have sex by the time they're age 19. Like that bothers me, you know, that's, they're not even in their 20s and they're already engaging in sexual acts. So that could be scary, but we don't want it to be all fear-based. We want it to be positive and healthy conversations as well. And because God created sex and it's good. So how do we tell our kids about that so that they can succeed? You know, we don't want it to be in a weird way or a preachy way. We want it to be healthy conversations and we want it to have healthy dialogue. And as parents, we want to be the ones initiating those in creative ways. And we believe that it's possible to do that. So Sarah just talked about, you know, sex outside of marriage. And uh, we just want to kind of touch upon that at the very beginning. Uh, sex outside of marriage, it comes with emotional and maybe physical baggage, right? And um, while everybody comes into a relationship with some sort of baggage or dysfunction, if you were here for the last seminar, we refer to them as negative family patterns through homewards. Uh, because we are all sinners raised by sinners, right? Whatever negative or dysfunction that you had in, from your parents, it got passed on to you. And then now you are passing them on to your children. Now, we want to be the generation to kind of overcome some of those negative family patterns. Like if your, your parents were yellers and screamers for, and that's how they dealt with conflict, your goal is to be a little bit less of a yeller or a screamer. And then hopefully your ch kids will be a little bit less of a yeller or a screamer. So, so it's, but sexual baggage is simply heavier baggage, right? It takes a lo much longer time to kind of uh, deal with and talk about and just uh, o overcome and unpack. We want uh, our children to go into relationships with little baggage, as little baggage as possible. Is that the right term? We don't want them to... To go into a relationship with huge, overstuffed size baggage that, you know, when you get to the airport counter, they double charge you because it's so heavy. <laughs> yeah, the bigger the bag, the longer it takes to unpack. Yeah. So I like that visual. Right. We want to start young and we want to start with honest and authentic relationships. That can be scary in case you're freaking out right now. What does that mean to have a conversation with my three year old? We're not talking about intercourse at the age of five. We're talking talking about how bodies are made, how God made our bodies, and what that looks like. We often would talk about, when I was working with youth, uh, a car analogy a little bit, and no analogy is perfect, so bear with me on this one a little bit. With us having the ability to have cars, right, we don't stick our kid in the front seat with a license when we're bringing them home from the hospital. We put them in the back facing backwards in a car seat, but we don't tell them they can't get in a car because they're not ready to drive it yet, right? And so that's kind of how I look at this as well. When you're driving a car or you're in a car, someday you get to turn the car seat around. Then you're in a booster seat. Then you're out of a booster seat. And then one day you finally get to sit in the front seat. It's not until you've gone through training, uh, behind the wheel testing, and actually passed a license test and have signed off that you'll follow the rules of the road before you're given the license to drive that car, right? There's a lot of preparation that went into that day. And so that's kind of what we look at this as well. There's a lot of preparation that goes into getting ready for that marriage license when you can enjoy the benefits of sex as much as you want. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I know that Sarah hates analogies. I but do the fact that she used one is amazing. That's, a, You're that's progress, honey. You're that's welcome. That's progress. It's like 25 years of progress later. <laughs> so let's get into what this purity code is. So in your booklet, we're gonna, uh, there are four points about the purity code. We're going to briefly touch on them at the beginning because we will come back around to it and get a, a more in-depth at the very end of this. So the first point of the purity code is honoring God with your body. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. I really love that we start with the body, because I think any time we talk about sex, that's the obvious part to talk about, because it involves our bodies. But what we're going to be doing is looking at God's word and how we can learn to 
honor our bodies, and yeah, he gives us loving direction. And so he tells us right from the start, it's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And so that's something good to remember as we go through this, what our bodies are meant for. The next one is renewing your mind for good. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our minds are a huge piece of this conversation. The, the struggle starts in our minds. Our minds can take us down paths we don't want it to and can really mess with us at times and is probably the more important component than even our bodies are when it comes to this conversation. The next component is uh, turning your eyes from worthless things, uh, Matthew 6.22. Is it possible to, keep, to teach our boys, our sons, not to look at uh, worthless things like pornography? Yeah, is it possible to help our girls learn how to dress in a way that honors their own body and is concerned about the people around them? Is it possible for us to teach all of our children what it means to be honoring of themselves and what they look at? We believe that it is. Well, what this point is really focusing on is some disciplines to balance your eyes and, and what your eyes are looking at. And then finally, guarding your heart above all else. The, uh, you get the verse for me. There you go, okay. Uh, Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. We have our priorities and our hearts can really mess with that at times. And so we need to make sure that we're, we ourselves are guarding our hearts, but that we're also teaching our children to guard our hearts. Our hearts and minds, you'll see, are interwoven through scripture together in so many ways. And actually, if you were to go back and look at all of Proverbs 4, my Bible calls it parental advice. It's all on wisdom and how wisdom is a beautiful thing. And we want to teach our children to make wise choices. So I would encourage you to go back at some point and read that entire chapter in Proverbs. Proverbs 4, four parental advice. But it, because our hearts can be so deceptive, we need to be on guard with that. All right. So we are going to, again, come back to that in ju uh, just a few moments uh, towards the end. So we're going to, uh, we hope today that it's, it's an encouraging day for you, that you leave here with feeling equipped and energized and say, yeah, and confident that I can do this, we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're going to uh, look at some facts, we're going to share some facts with you and uh, give you three perspectives on the sexuality crisis. Now we are going to give you some statistics and sh uh, share with you some studies that we've, uh, uh, we've been done. trained on. Don't be alarmed, okay? These are just, inform think of this as information and maybe a, a, an inspiration of why we need to start these conversations. Uh, for the first perspective is from the world or the secular perspective. In a secular perspective, one of the main tenets is that co of cohabitation, that it's okay. Everybody's going to do it, so why not? You know, there's nothing wrong with it. But really, statistics show um, that 74% of people will cohabitate before they get married. Right? And if they end up getting married after that, there's a greater chance for divorce, a greater chance for adultery, and ironically, a greater chance of less sexual satisfaction. Um, divorce is the, uh, adultery is the number one uh, cause of divorces in America today. If those relationships produce children, uh, and then the uh, studies will show that children of divorce will, all, will have more difficulties uh, later on in life. Again, uh, we don't want to alarm you, we don't want to discourage you, um, but we do want, want to educate you because uh, Christian and secular studies are showing the exact same thing. The numbers are a little different, but they're showing, they're trending the same thing, except the, the secularists just won't, they won't moralize this issue. And the other thing we just want to encourage you to is, you know, again, we don't know what any of your stories are from this perspective. It's not an impossibility to overcome these statistics. However, our goal is to help our children not be those statistics, right? We want them to be part of the 26% that isn't having to worry about that. Like, let's give them on a trajectory of health in this area. We also have the Christian perspective. So you've got your secular perspective, and then there's the Christian perspective. 
The Christian perspective generally focuses on what's right or wrong, what is the sin, um, what is the do's and don'ts, a list of things you can and cannot do. We have purity codes. We've, we've seen those in multiple churches. What we can be challenged with is that we often forget to look at the joy and the beauty of relationship when we're teaching these things. And so we want the Christian perspective to be a healthy, fun perspective, not a don't do this, do this, and just because we said so. We want it to be informative, and we really want to help our kids along. There's a third perspective that I want to uh, bring up today. It's called intim instant intimacy. It's a tongue twister for sure, so as I say it, I appreciate your forgiveness. <laughs> instant intimacy perspective. There's a Lutheran pastor, his name is Dr. Ray Short, and he did many studies on this, and I found it fascinating. He learned that sex can actually fool you into what he's calling instant intimacy. You believe that you have fallen in love simply because you've had sex. And we know that that's not necessarily the case. Love is a choice. But when you're young and you have puppy love or you feel like you're in love with someone, it feels very real. And it can last for up to three years before you look at the person next to you and go, I actually don't know if I do like you. Yeah. Should we have ever been married at all? The, you, you jump over all of the relationship building possibilities and you go straight to this instant intimacy. Studies show that it takes up to two years to actually fall in love with someone and be totally committed to the relationship. Well, with those statistics, we want to encourage waiting because two years of getting to know someone as a friend and building a relationship with them is so much better than being tricked into, I think I love you, but actually I don't really like you at all. Right. So, so why are kids making decisions about having sex? Well, uh, it kind of boils down to three reasons why <laughs> kids are making decisions about having sex. The first one, it's obvious. It's, uh, it's just peer pressure. Right? They want to fit in. They want to feel like they conform. They, want to, they don't want to be the outsider. But oftentimes, they just want, uh, they're doing things just to kind of go with the crowd, go with the flow. The second reason is uh, their emotional involvement exceeds their mm -hmm. maturity level. Right? Again, just like Sarah just said, they confuse their puppy love with real love. They're not um, mature enough to either set boundaries or follow their own boundaries. We find that in, the, in this case, uh, sometimes the girls or, or people just say, I don't know how to say no when this situation happened. Yeah, we uh, have another, another analogy. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, when, uh, Progress. I use the analogy of an escalator. Have you ever tried to run down and up the escalator? You know, you get on the escalator and like, oh, wait, I forgot to get something. I got to run back down it. Okay, well, so the wise choice would be to not, when it comes to sexual intimacy and having a relationship, would not to be getting on that escalator until you know that you're in that relationship and it's solid and you're headed towards marriage. One of the things I like to say is, I would teach, when teaching a small group of girls one time, was like, listen, every time you step on that escalator, it gets, the further you go up you go, the harder it is to get off right? I mean, has anyone ever done that? Am I the only one that's ever run down an up escalator? Okay, so you have seen that. So we would talk about that, like, yeah, it's, it's really fun to dabble with that, right? You're going up, but then the further up you get that escalator, the harder it is to run down. But if you wait till marriage to get on that escalator, you can ride it to the top and not feel bad about it. You can do it again and again <laughs> and again. So you got to know how to say, no, I'm not getting on the escalator. All right. And the last reason uh, kids are having, uh, making decisions, it's just a lack of information. Again, just like the show of hands, you know, not, not, not many of us, myself included, had a conversation about it with our parents. So where are they going to get their information if they're not getting it from you? Where are they going to get it? That's kind of a scary, scary question if you think about it, because there's no shortage of false information out there that's available to them. How many of you have kids that are about that age, elementary school? Very fun. <laughs> the playground the conversations things. and school conversations are some of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the question we have to ask is, uh, why does sex have influence? Uh, and the first reason is because sex is everywhere. And we alluded yeah. to that earlier. It's everywhere in culture, and it influences everyone. It's in our music. It's in our movies, magazines, social media, internet, YouTube. It's everywhere. Do you know that there are over 14,000 sexual innuendos during primetime TV each year? That's a lot. 
that's a lot. So as we look at the shows that we're even watching with our kids in the room, you know, we, we, what we practice is what we become good at. And so it can be super confusing even to ourselves when we wake up one day and go, oh, I didn't notice that in that show before. And all my kids have been watching it, and what they watch us watch, they will assume is okay. And so we, I know for us, for sure, when our kids were really little, we really reevaluated some of the shows we were watching. Uh, I love to watch Friends um, when our kids were little. I think Great it's one of the funniest shows of all time. But then when I started looking at it from a kid's perspective and the values we might have been teaching them, we cut yeah. that show out. Mm -hmm. I, and I was kind of bummed because it is funny. But we wanted to make sure our kids didn't think that was the norm, that was the normal living. As they got older though, when those shows come up and they're watching them, we can use those as opportunities for conversation, right? So it becomes a little different. So you just have to be age appropriate with it. When we lived in Las Vegas, uh, we were there for 13 years combined. We met at UNLV, left and then moved back. We uh, had a great time. There's a great Christian community in Vegas, had amazing yeah. friends there. Uh, it's actually a really awesome place. But as our kids started getting older, we noticed that the casinos and the stuff that comes with it was starting to move into our neighborhood. So if you have problems with gambling, drugs, sex, pornography, any of that, Vegas is not the place for you to move, <laughs> okay? Not a good spot for you to go, because it's, it's in your face there. Uh, because it is, you can have good conversations, clearly, about it, but it, if you have any of those issues, you can't go there. Well, what we noticed is our kids were starting to get older, and that was moving in, the taxi cabs would go by, you know, and we always used to joke, my girls never aspired to have their butt on the back of that taxi cab ad, but as our son entered the picture, all of a sudden, we were painfully aware that God designed boys to think women are pretty hot, and we didn't want that to start becoming a distraction. So Tommy felt really strongly that we needed to think about moving somewhere else, and yes. we Go ended west. up in San Diego. Yeah, we ended up in San Diego, and we thought, okay, this is great. There's, we're not going to have that problem here. <laughs> Newsflash, that Whoa. problem is everywhere. We found ourselves at the beach. You want, you want me to tell it? You want to tell it? Yeah, so <laughs> we're at the beach, and Keith, uh, he's probably five, six years old, runs up to, Mama, Mama, that girl has a nuclear wedgie. <laughs> sure enough, she had a purposeful nuclear wedgie. <laughs> uh, yeah, ouch. So uh, we just <laughs> want to we share that to acknowledge that we can't escape it. It's everywhere, it's no everywhere. matter where you live, what part of the country. Just want to acknowledge that it's out there. And be prepared to navigate the waters of it. Yeah. You know, living in California, we do have beach time, right? So yeah. we, we have, it's coming into summer, beach time and pool time is prevalent out here for sure, yeah. in addition to all the other things that you'd navigate from culture. So we can have really good, healthy beach conversations. The second reason why sex is such an influence, it's mysterious, right? Kids are just naturally curious individuals and beings to begin with. You remember what it was like when you were their age. Right? And they, wanna, they have questions, and they want to try to figure stuff out. And so even, uh, even good kids, the kids who go to church, they, they will experiment. Boys experiment uh, physically. Girls experiment verbally. So we want to kind of break that mystery about it to them. And, you know, mm -hmm. they want to know, hey, where are you guys going this weekend? Why are we leaving with grandma and grandpa? You know, just, uh, don't worry about it. You know, mm -hmm. we, it, it is mysterious. And they'll, uh, they'll do anything they, they can to find answers to their questions. The third point is uh, why it has an influence is sex is mysterious, right? Be, let's be truthful it's about fun. it. It's fun. It's good. It's pleasurable, <laughs> right? Just let your kids know it's a part of your life. And, and be honest about it, okay. and yeah. not try to hide it. Right. One of the challenges we have are the mixed messages that kids get, and so we want to talk about that for a second, the mixed messages that we send. And the first one is from us, from a parental perspective. So we sometimes say nothing. That's our, student, our children come to us, and uh, well, we, we just ignore the topic. We don't say anything to them. It just tells them we don't care, or it's not important to them. That is something that we want to talk about. The other thing is sometimes we give, we don't even realize we've given a mixed message. I had a conversation with a girl one time who said, my mom told me not to have sex because she didn't want me to get pregnant. Said girl figured out how to have sex and not get pregnant, right? I mean, that's a mixed message. I'm pretty sure that mom didn't mean figure out how to have sex and not get pregnant, right? That's not what she was talking about. She, but because she didn't follow up that with the healthy reasons besides not getting pregnant outside of marriage that could be harmful to you, 
that was totally missed in this girl's life. And so we don't want to send those mixed messages. We have to make sure that we're answering the questions. The other place you get a mixed message is from church. And we don't spend a huge amount of time uh, talking about it, right? Because it's a parent's job to have conversations with their kids about sex. But that's why we're doing seminars like this one today, is we want to make sure you are equipped to have those conversations. We often send the message in church that it's dirty and disgusting and don't do it. Save it for marriage and the one you love. Anyone else? <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. Right? And the adults today still have, they can um, struggle to reconcile those negative views. I was told all along as a child, don't do it. It's ugly. It's disgusting. Do you know how bad that is? Well, wait a minute. That's not what God says about sex. That's a mixed message. And so you think that your parents don't want to talk about it. Your church thinks it's dirty and ugly. Culture's telling you something very different. All right. And so the third mixed message is, is from culture. Right? Culture, again, with all those innuendos on TV and all the advertisements and everything in, in music, it sends a mixed message. It says that, that hey, you're going to do it, so here's how to do it. Protect yourself, condoms, birth control. And so... It's hard, yeah. I would say, too, our kids, we were part of the public school system, and especially in California, you'll see that the, where the age level is that they're exposing our kids to the topic of sex is getting younger and younger and younger. You definitely want to be ahead of that. And so I, I would say we were, in, both in Las Vegas and in California, we were the only parents that went to watch the information our kids were going to see in school. That was surprising to me. We, they sent a note home that said, this is what we're going to cover. If you'd like to see it first, go down to the school district office. You can view it. And both school district offices went, wow, no one's ever come before. What? Right. How is that possible? So I would say to you, if you have younger children, go in and watch those videos. We were so glad we did because in Las Vegas, it was, ironically, in Las Vegas, it was super simple. It was body image. It was how your body's developing. Here, when I got to the video and it ta started talking about how they were teaching them about oral sex in fifth grade, I thought, wow, that's a topic I didn't think I needed to cover so early. Good to know. So before our kids went to watch those videos, we said, here's what they're going to cover today. Let us know if you have any questions. We'd rather you heard it from us than you heard it from school. We also erred on the side, and every parent has to make their own choice, that we would rather them go ahead and watch the videos than hear about the videos from their friends. Right? We can see where the, a friend watching the video and then telling my kid later about what those were might have something could get lost in translation. And so we decided that rather than them skipping it all together or not participating, that's what we would do. But we felt comfortable with that because we had watched the videos first. So that's kind of the direction we went. So whether you are homeschooling, private school, public school, be ahead of those conversations in the home and you'll be better off. Right. Again, it's just what we want to start those conversations. We want to break that mystery. And uh, again, we were kind of surprised. Well, they're talking about that already at this age? I thought we would have to, we could avoid this for another 10 years. <laughs> Not going to happen. Thought that we have a special and unique opportunity today. We're titling this Talking with Our Kids About Sex and Dating. All three of them have graciously and courageously agreed to let us interview them a smidge, right? So would you welcome Gracie, Lucy, and Keith to the front? Hello. Welcome. You guys sit in birth order, please. <laughs> oh. This is, we thought oh. it would be fun to. Uh, have a little bit of a conversation with them. Um, let me give you some background on why. Uh, first of all, none of us have a perfect story, and so we thought we can share our imperfections and uh, silly things that we've navigated along the way. Uh, but also, as we prepared for this, they had some incredible insight. Uh, we do share most of our parenting seminar stuff at this point with our young adult children as well. And we, they, they had such good insight that we asked if they'd be willing to do that, and they said yes. And so we are excited that you're here today. Our own perspective is we feel like we've done an incredible job. <laughs> we've had no uh, awkward conversations ever. <laughs> We're the best parents ever. No. <laughs> and that's our own little self-assurance right. before we get authentic and real right here. <laughs> I, I think they would beg to differ about that right. part. So one of the things that we, um, rules we had in our home or, or things we lived by was that you could ask any question you wanted. We had a parameter of it didn't matter what it was. So whether it was regarding school or uh, initially it became, uh, if you hear a bad word, we wanted you to come to ask us what it meant. We wanted to tell you what that meant. And so I just wanted to ask you how that has shaped your life and if that had positive meaning, if it worked, that type of, that type of thing.
All right, well, while she's figuring that out, I'll <laughs> jump in here. Um, one of the things that I would say with having this whole open, like knowing I could talk about anything, when we were talking about this earlier, my mom said that in first grade, I don't remember this at all, but apparently in first grade, I remember seeing, walking into the bathroom when I, at my new school, I've been there for like three weeks, months, something like that, and it was the F word written like big letters across the wall, and I was like, huh, I've never seen that word before. I got home and I was like, hey, mom. I, she said, he walked home and I was like, hey, what does this mean? And she said, come ask me when you're 10. And I said, okay, 10th birthday came around. Hey, mom, remember when you said I could ask you what this meant? What does this mean? So we should have said 12. True story. <laughs> so it was just the confidence, not necessarily like, I personally have not had many like awkward, like, hey, what about this, 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 like conversations like that with my parents, but that's just because I'm very verbally processing and also like just sit in my room and, huh, let's think about this. Oh, I'm sure I'll find out later, like not necessarily like urgent things ever. So. I think it was just always the confidence knowing that I could go and ask them if I ever had a tough time. And it also came more, not necessarily with awkward conversations, but when something like, hey, uh, I kind of got in trouble for school for this today. So uh, you're probably going to get a phone call or even now of, hey, I got Mark Babson in a class and uh, I wasn't there. So you're going to get that call. So just let you know now, I wasn't there. <laughs> just being able to know that like, even if I might get in trouble for it, that I could always come to them and they would always give me their best and like most honest opinion and answer with any question that I ask them. Um, yeah, I think for me, knowing that I could come to my parents and ask um, any kind of question was super, um, it made my parents really safe people. Like I knew they would never get mad at me for asking a question, even if it was something that they did not necessarily maybe want to talk to me about. And they always told us that if, we could ask whatever question, but they weren't maybe going to give us an instantaneous answer. Like, that's a good question. Let me get back to you on that. But I will answer your question and um, do my research. And maybe they'd ask us more questions about why we were asking the question that we were asked. So I feel like it really set us up to really trust our parents and really feel safe in that space. Yeah. And uh, Ooh, yours is loud. <laughs> <laughs> She's got the good one. For, for me, I felt like there's a lot of things that I learned at school, just like, I would pick up on things and like, I think it means this, but then I could always go home and be like, what does this mean? Just to like confirm what I thought. And sometimes the answer would be like, well, what do you think that means? And then I would explain and like, actually, it doesn't mean that at all. So <laughs> it, it just gave a space where as you're learning things from friends or just from like hearing random conversations that you might think you know the answer, but maybe you don't and maybe you do. And then it's, um, just an opportunity to have further conversations of like what those things mean and how like they like would personally affect mm -hmm. me in my life at some point or never. Right, well and you had shared uh, when we were originally talking about this as well that it, practicing that even with us opened up opportunities to be confident in other scenarios. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, so like I think s initiating that like you can always come to us and ask questions. It gave me the confidence at church to ask questions to small group leaders or at school to ask questions about a math problem. So asking questions wasn't as scary. Uh, I don't have specific stats, but I think when, as you get older, you ask fewer questions. Like your two year old's gonna ask you lots of questions. Like, what's that mean? Or what, how do you say that? But when you're 25, it's like, it's for some reason society says, if you ask questions, you're, you're ignorant. You don't know what you're doing. But I think through, even through high school and college, it always left room for asking questions to other adults in my life as well. So like initiating that from parents who are very safe people through other adults in yes, other situations. Yes, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also going back to the questions, if you ask any of the teachers that we have had, the three of us are not afraid to ask questions. <laughs> um, I know especially when I remember going to, I think it was Gracie's choir banquet or something like that. Her teacher said, Gracie's always the one to ask, oh, can we go over this again? What does this sound like? How is this and this and this? And I remember doing the same thing where I'm known for talking a lot, but a lot of times <laughs> I would ask questions of, and everyone, like, I literally remember hearing people just go, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that either, but I wasn't gonna ask it. But I'm like, not being afraid to ask questions opens up to understanding more, not necessarily like knowing more deeper knowledge, but getting more clarification and leading to more confidence to ask questions, especially I think of almost like, authority figures because mm -hmm. there's a whole thing in church of kids don't talk and then adults talk but then not being able to like being able to have the confidence in myself to go to any adult and ask a question or like hey if i like it's a boss like hey why are we doing it this way and then being able to get that clarification so that way we know like everything like the reason we're doing everything yeah i yeah. love that we often found too that if uh, 
we would say to them, if you don't ask a question, 100% sure someone else doesn't know the answer to that as well. So someone's gotta be the one to do it. So that fear, lean into the, the fear of, I'm afraid to ask this and have the courage to ask the question. So that was good, thanks. Yeah. So uh, think about all the conversations we've had. And we, you know, we've never had, we never had the, like the videos that sat down and talk about the rocket and the spaceship docking, <laughs> like those kind of conversations. But uh, can you share about some of the conversations that we have had, and uh, especially about dating and about sex? Um, I don't remember. I don't, get I don't remember actually, I don't actually remember having any of these conversations with my parents. Um, <laughs> I, I must have blocked it from my memory, honestly. Because <laughs> up until like more in my 20s as I've been going through like college and whatnot, I like in my head is like, oh, I learned everything about sex through school, which I know make, is absolutely not true. There's no way I possibly did that. And I had to have conversations with my parents. Um, but I still... Like the only conversation I remember having with my parents about it was actually I got sat down and I don't even remember how it came up, but I just remember saying, oh my gosh, this is so awkward. I didn't need to know that. I didn't want to know that. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I'm being told this, but like, I knew that it was important to my family and to my parents that I, like, I hear it from them first versus hearing it from some other source that maybe didn't have my best interests at heart. Um, I know we wanted, <laughs> my parents weren't necessarily in huge favor of us dating in high school, um, we all three chose to date in high school, and when I came to my parents and was like, I think I really like this guy, he asked me out, they just wanted me to be, like, take a long, hard look at what my end goals were in the relationship and make sure that I was ready for that space before jumping in. They were gonna love and support me no matter what, but they wanted me to be aware of, like, okay, well, what are your values? What do you wanna do in this relationship? Mm -hmm. Where do you want it to go? Um, so that's kind of my insight into that question. Okay. I know for me personally, I never ask questions about dating and sex whenever because I was like, you know what, I'll leave that to my two older sisters to figure it out. <laughs> and then while they're having these awkward conversations, I'll sit there, pretend I'm listening to music on my iPod and just kind of <laughs> listen <to it laughs> silently so that they, then they don't start asking me stuff. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm listening to music. I'm, I'm to some Beyonce. Smart kid. While you're doing something. Or then I also remember, That's true. I was, as I was younger, I was very curious about a lot of things but I never wanted to ask. And I was always curious about what my parents were talking about when they closed their door in their room or when they were talking to Lucy or Gracie in their room. So I know for sure I'd sit in my room and pretend I was playing Wii or something like that, like playing Mario Kart with my headset on and just being like, you know what, I'm actually not listening to anything and just listen to what they were saying and pick up like, oh, that makes sense. All right, well, now I know I don't need to ask that because someone else already did and I know the answer. So, so the walls are very thin in your homes. Yes. Was, was, Be aware of that. I was like, is this cheating to not ask these questions and then just get the answers from them? I was like, no, honestly, I'm fine with it. So then it wasn't ever like, but as a warning to parents, your kids can hear a lot more than you probably think they can. So be very careful about what you're talking about, especially when you close the door and don't know who's sitting right there listening on the other side of your door. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> but yeah, that's how... Noted. That's how I feel. Like, I never, like, really wanted to ask the questions, but then I knew that from hearing that, I knew their values with dating, their values with sex and everything. So then coming up to my own values, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna kind of like modify those to what I think, but still keep the general core values of it with it. So I, I changed it. So one of my initial things was I'm not dating anyone until I have my driver's license because I didn't want to have to worry about, hey mom, can you drop me off to go hang out with my girlfriend who also can't drive? And then, like, it was like, it just got to me like, if I didn't have my driver's license, it was like a play date when your kid's like, hey, can you go take me to the playground so I can go play in the sandbox? Like, it was, like, I just didn't feel like it was right. So then that was one of the things like, uh, I set myself to, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing it. So okay. that's just where yeah. kind of my values is born. Play dates just took on a whole different meaning then. <laughs> <laughs> got anything? No. <laughs> so, uh, so girls, when it comes, uh, so when it comes to dating, and when you get, in, when you got to be that age, uh, can you want to talk about uh, that phase and and how you felt with that, with Gracie, especially since she was the first, she's the oldest, so she was first into the dating scene. So, share your thoughts on that. Well, oh wait, Lucy's going first. That's perfect. Right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we take uh, charge. Yeah, I, I feel like for me it was. Well, you always, there was like this precedent that any guy that we ever wanted to have a, go on a date with, start dating, they had to come talk to you first. And I, for the longest time, probably even up until, I don't know, 
like a year and a half ago, I didn't really know what you were talking about. So like, it would be one of those things where I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, this is great, but you're gonna have to talk to my dad. And like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what are they gonna talk about? And I'm like, I really don't know. And so it was like, I, I mean, uh, I haven't had to have a lot of those conversations, but I think I remember there was probably a span where like three of those conversations happened, probably within, I don't know, nine months. And someone was like, I've had a lot of those conversations recently. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Popular. <laughs> but I think once once I learned what they were about and just about wanting to uh, to set the precedent with the guy that I'm going out with that like he's transferring the responsibility per to protect me to to him I, it became more of something like yeah I want every guy that I go out with to have that conversation of how important I am to my family and how they are taking on that responsibility in a sense. So it became less of an, an embarrassment thing of like, you have to go talk to my dad now to like, I'm, I want you to go talk to my dad. Like this is important to me and not just to my parents. Yeah, I can kind of speak to that. So I, in, uh, in middle school, um, I, my dad came to me and said, um, so whoever you want to go out with needs to come talk to me first. And I found out that he had a book. <laughs> interviewing your daughter's date, and I was utterly mortified. And I actually sneaked into my parents' room to go read this book to find out what on earth could my dad possibly be talking to any guy that I want to date about. Like, I was so like, what the heck is this? In, as, and then as I got older, it actually became one of those things where it was like, yeah, totally, like, that's a thing that happens. Um, and we, in my high school group, we did a panel, like a dating panel, and it was like a bunch of, like, women and, um, and then Sarah was on that. To, um, my parents were on it and talking to students about it, and come to find out that my dad interviewing like any guy who wanted to date me was unusual. Like my friends being like, "I wish my dad had done that." It was just kind of like, a, "Whoa!" Like not every dad does this. Like I thought every dad was doing this <laughs> kind right. of thing because it was it did set the precedent that like mm -hmm. it, you're not only like you're gonna protect her, you're gonna take care of her, like honor her kind of thing, it made it so that when I got to be my 20s and my dad was driving in the car with me, he just randomly brought up like, so as like you're dating in college years, like do you, like you don't necessarily have to have that any guy come talk to me, and I was like, why wouldn't I have any guy come mm. talk to you? Like I want them to come talk to you. Um, so it kind of, which I guess surprised him that I would want that. <laughs> yeah, really well. One of the things I love about that particular story, it's twofold, is that uh, we, they, we, it affirmed in us that that thing that Tommy painstakingly did that was hard just as a human being to say, I want to talk to every person you date, like there was affirmation in that that was a good thing and we should stick with it. One of the things she didn't share with you about that panel was that the girls in that room, nine out of 10 of them had already had sex. So when they said, I wish my dad had had that conversation on my behalf. They weren't joking. It sometimes makes me want to cry. I love those girls. <laughs> and yeah. they wish someone had, been on, had had accountability for them and had been on their side. So I say to you, even though it's hard and it's uncomfortable and your middle schoolers will not like it, <laughs> uh, to, to stay the course. Stay the course and do the hard thing. Because in the long run, if you don't stay the course and do those hard things, you know, we're setting them up for, for failure, potentially. So we want to do everything we can on our end as parents to set them up for success. Yeah, that book was a really great resource for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, I was nervous about it because I, I didn't want my daughters to date till they were 30. But, <laughs> you know, it helped me kind of frame my worries and kind of calm my anxiety anxieties about this next step in their lives. It also, it, it gave me a perspective from their point of view on why it is important to have that conversation. So, uh, so that was the second reason. And the third reason, I love what the book said about the, uh, the need to have that conversation with young men, and because there are, they're not having that conversation w in their families or in their home. They're getting it off the street, off their friends. And so they need to have a perspective about why it's important, why this young woman is so precious, and why you need to honor her and care for her in a, in likewise. So well, I think from all three of those perspectives, it was a great resource, and it helped me. I, I was surprised. You know, I, I expected that once I, I, the first time I did it, I was just as nervous as, uh, as a young boy. But now I was like, oh, that's fun. Bring it on. Come on. Who's next? Bring it on. Who's, Who's on? next? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I've, I've relished that honor and that privilege to do that. And uh, so 
Yeah, it, it was a bit of a surprise to me when they're in their 20s that they still wanted me to do it. But so I was like, okay, great, thank you. I, I, I'm glad to do it. One of the things, uh, one last question for you guys, unless you can think of something that we missed, was we, our hopes and dreams for our kids in all areas of life is that they, the values that we've taught them as young children, that they will eventually own those for themselves. So we would teach them everything we know about Jesus because Jesus is the center of our lives, but also recognizing they have to choose to follow Jesus on their own. So when it comes to sex and dating and your own personal values, we've often asked, like, what are your values? That was the only way Tommy could go have those conversations with these young men was because he had had talks with them that says, what are your values and how can we support you in those? We want to help you be accountable without policing it. And so as you think of that, is there anything you can share where you're at now as young adults having come through that? So uh, I would say from my perspective, I've always been quite a risk taker, not necessarily mm. with like, but, but and definitely pushing boundaries a lot, whether it was being able to keep my iPod or a phone in my room past a certain time or being able to go skateboarding without a helmet or skateboarding downhill super fast, cliff jumping, climbing on buildings in downtown, doing stupid stuff with my friends. I was always like pushing curfew back. Like, hey mom, I was like, hey, be home by 10. Well, especially when I got my license, this was terrible. I was like, why can't I scout till 2.30 a.m.? Like, I'm just sitting here doing nothing. Like, what's wrong? <laughs> and it was just, oh, well, it's illegal. One, two, <laughs> nothing good happens past 12 anyways. So then it was always like, well, how about 10.15? Uh, no, okay, how about now 10, 15? Uh, no, like getting to the point where it was eventually was like, okay, home by 11, and then it was, and then I was like, I was like, dude, why can't I just stay out later? Or why can't I go skateboarding without a helmet? Or why can't I do this and this and this? And it was always, it took me until about uh, two years ago, something like that, I was skateboarding with my friend down a hill, going quite fast, and I ate it really hard. Cracked my helmet from the back here to about halfway up the front. Yeah, we still have that. If I wasn't wearing a helmet, I'd be sitting on the floor dead right now yep. because I, my head would have cracked open. And realizing that even though the boundaries I hated completely like, were meant to keep me healthy and keep me safe and not just so my parents because they were trying to be a buzzkill and make me sit at home <laughs> doing nothing, but it was because they wanted the best for me. And so, yeah, so the cliff jumping because it's fun. But like realizing now, like some of the stuff they were telling me wasn't just because they were like, this is our values, it was because like, yeah, they let me do it, but they had, when they let me go skateboarding, it was, but you have to wear a helmet. When they let me, like they said, no, you can't go climbing on buildings in downtown because you could get arrested and go to jail because you're climbing on a building in downtown. And then it was also like, things was like, no, you can't have your phone in your room. And I always wondered why. And then realizing now how easy the internet is to access on anything, it could like, it's not that hard. And almost like wishing now, not necessarily like wishing now, but like realizing now, like, Stay strict on a lot of things because keeping your phone in your room, there's nothing good that goes on in the internet with a, with a middle school boy, high school boy, if they're sitting in their room by themselves with internet. They could just be watching videos, they could just be playing video games, they could just be talking to their friends, but there's a good chance they aren't. Mm -hmm. Like, it's mm -hmm. not that hard to look up anything. And if that's what they're right. finding all their information from on sex, on dating, on like what people's, the world's values are, it's not a good thing because mm -hmm. everything in media, like if, if you're yeah. just listening to music, like while they're sleeping, what's the music saying? What's the videos mm -hmm. that they're watching saying? Like you don't know that because they're behind a closed door with their phone in their room, like by themselves. Because mm -hmm. my parents even always had a rule until recently, uh, not even until recently, until like a while ago, like when they started trusting us more, it was like, not necessarily trusting us more, but like, <laughs> we were like giving us more freedom, I'm giving you more making our own decisions. Yeah. It was like, they always said, if you're on the internet, keep your door open because they don't, they want to be able to like, if you're doing something, if you're afraid to do something on your phone or online with where you want the door closed, then you shouldn't be doing it in general. So whether it's yeah. having that value of, okay, I remember we always had a home computer and it was always, you're only allowed on the internet on this home computer because, or outside on, at the dining room table or on the living room on the couch where we can see what you're doing at all times. And then that was, even though yeah. I hated it at the time, realizing now it was like, it kept us accountable of making sure that everything we were doing or interacting mm -hmm. or who we were talking to was always healthy and would make the best choices for us. Right. Yeah, and I think it, there was, I mean, when I was younger, it was one of those things where there are parents' values and I knew that they were biblically based, so I followed them because I respected my parents and I wanted to follow the Bible as best as I could. And then as I got older, there was always a space for these are our values and the ones that there's not like a, a verse in the Bible that says da 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 da. There's, there was the room to 
kind of figure things out on your own and kind of sculpt your own values. And sometimes it worked out fine and sometimes we would crash and burn and stuff would go wrong. But I think having that open conversation kind of bringing it back to being able to ask questions and have conversations, they were always there to help us when there was heartbreak or help us when we were in a tough situation that we got ourselves into because we didn't follow their values. So it, it just kind of, by having this set precedent in what we, knowing what their values were and their codes almost, we had the room to, to stray from them, but also knew that there was also the grace to come back and have them as a support system. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's starting out with the like asking questions thing really set the precedent for like, um, like you said, being able to come back and knowing that we we're unconditionally loved no matter what story we're about to say. Like, so I hated a couple times that I've had to come and say, so this happened, I don't know what to do. How can you, like, and they would partner with me to help me with that. Like, never wanted those things, to, never wanted me to have that kind of baggage, but knowing that they loved me and supported me and would help me move beyond making that baggage my identity mm -hmm. and just really processing that, like, with when it came to like going to God with it, going to my parents, and helping figure out like where exactly we go from here. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we're so loved and so blessed, and for me personally, it's my goal and aspiration to be like my parents someday when I have my own kids. So. She wants to be oh, like me. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> like me. So you have one more? Yes. Okay. I would also say, as parents, be very strict with a lot of things because you're going to get kids eventually, even if it's not your kids that are like me and will always <laughs> constantly ask you every other day when they're going to hang out with their friends, hey, can I stay up past this time? Can I do this? Can I do this? And there's a lot of things that I would ask my parents that were very dumb things. Or, and also, don't be afraid. One of the things I hated the most when <laughs> I first got my phone was my parents said, all right, but we have to have your location. When I got my driver's license, I was like, why? I'm not gonna like do anything dumb. Like, where you, I, I don't just want you to see where I am all the time. Realizing now, there's a very good reason they asked for my location. And that was a very good thing because then they could see, oh, he's not where he said he was gonna be. Oh, he is definitely not where he said he was gonna be. Why is he in downtown? He said he was gonna go to his friend's house and his pool. Come so, like, don't be afraid to like read into things because, or ask, I would say like other high school or college age guys, like, hey, what are they doing? Because there's a very good chance that if you don't know what they're doing, someone else would. Like I would say with, um, like things at school, like there's a whole vaping thing going on right now with like jewels and whatever. And it's, for adults, it might seem like I don't even notice it, but for anyone in high school that's around it or sees it or like can't see it, it's yeah. not that hard to yeah. see. I'm like, dude, I yeah. can point out every single time some freshman guy sitting at his, when his desk, when he suddenly puts his head down and starts breathing and really heavy in his backpack. Like, it's not that hard to see, but it's something that adults <laughs> won't necessarily notice. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to come to someone like, who's, you're like, oh, but I feel weird asking an 18 year old guy, like, opinions on this thing. Well, it's like, well, like, opening that with my parents too, they'd always come to me and ask questions like, hey, how do I take a picture on my phone? Because they don't necessarily, <laughs> you don't like, yeah. as technology grows, the, it mm -hmm. changes. And as things like develop, like, don't be afraid to like ask questions and stay strict on things and get more information with it. Cool. All right, That's well, done. thank you guys for coming up and leave. being part of this. Will you thank them? The reason that I appreciate these conversations is as our kids get into adult years is their values may change. Uh, we taught in Confident Parenting that it's not uncommon for adult values to change. And you wake up one day, I had a conversation with a woman last week. She's like, well, my 50-year-old daughter just made some choices that I don't agree with. So, you know, this parent thing, it's lifetime. And we need to make sure that we're supporting the values they actually have. And those are the waters that we're navigating right now. One of the things, um, I would encourage you to do is to ask yourself, do my kids know my values and do they know where I stand on these things as they get older and they become adults? If they do, then we need to find other things to talk about. Right. We, and we don't want to be a one-topic uh, parent. Again, uh, conversations are great, but if you're always bringing up the same thing every time, then they're just going to tune you out, and they're going to ignore you. And uh, someday you, you'll have some good information for them, but they've already kind of disconnected from that topic. So again, be, uh, be well-rounded in what you want to talk about. Bring about different things, and find out what's going on in their lives, and, bring that, uh, and you can bring uh, sex and dating into almost every conversation. 
Yeah, we just want to be parents who are there when our kids need us and find something we have in common. I always uh, say, strip it back. What is something you actually have in common? Start there. You know, we love to do nails. Let's go get a pedicure. We like, like to play baseball. Let's just talk baseball for a while. Uh, getting it to a space where there's, you're, you're having fun and enjoying a piece of a conversation is better than no conversation at all. So. Yeah, and in the, I think what, the, what Gracie said is that you know, the, our kids w know that they are unconditionally loved. Yeah, we're not going to like or agree with the decisions that, that they make, and sometimes they stray for our own values, but they know that we're the place to come back to their safe, that will accept them, that will help them work through whatever, it is, whatever difficulty they have. But we're the ones who are the, the, the ones that they come back to. <laughs> right. Before we go on, uh, we want to touch on a, a one subject, and this uh, we recognize is very, very sensitive, uh, and it, it may affect some people in this audience, and uh, that is sexual abuse. Okay, the statistics are alarming. Again, we don't want to alarm you; we just want to provide some information, mm -hmm. and they're kind of all over the place, but they're all trending in the same way. Uh, the slide says one in four, but I've seen studies that say it's one in three girls, one in six boys will be a victim of sexual assault before the age of 18. But only one in 20 of those cases are ever reported. And so uh, of those sexual uh, abuses, 80% are done by somebody that they know, they trust, or they love. Over 60% of those cases are done by a relative. Those are just, uh, just some cold fact uh, statistics. And we pray that it never ha affects your family at all, but we want to recognize that your children may know somebody who has been. And so we want to be just prepared and kind of just acknowledge that, again, that it's, mm -hmm. it's out there. So we just want to say, what, what do we tell our kids if they themselves find themselves in that situation or they know someone who has? And the first thing is, is that they always, always need to know it's not their fault. It is not always. your fault ever. It's always the abuser's fault. We don't want them to suffer in silence and we want them to bring those conversations forward. Again, practicing those conversations with our kids when they're younger makes you a safe person to go to if they have something scary. And especially if there's an abuser that says, if you tell something bad will happen to you, Wow, if that's someone they know that's saying that. And, and oftentimes too, it wasn't our kids, but our kids would tell us stories of a friend. My friend had this. Okay, now we need to navigate that. How can we help you help your friend? How can we, we you know, we're praying through with those scenarios and what can we do for that? And so we want them to know that they can be courageous and that there is hope. As Christ followers, we want them to know that God cares. You know, we know that in scripture, Jesus wept. God is a God who cares for us and he weeps at our pain. He understands that pain and he cares for us and he will be with us through that pain. And so we need to help them navigate that. Again, hoping that there's this this isn't something we're dealing with with our own kids, but should we don't want to have blinders on, right? We, if it were to happen to them, we'd want to know how to help our children through this rather than them suffering in silence on their own. There's more information in the back of your book on this particular topic. We're not going to spend a whole lot more on it today, but we didn't want to go throughout this session without even at least addressing that. And the most important thing that we think our kids can have from us in this is to know who they can go to. We figure that there's two scenarios. They can either say, oh no, I hope my mom and dad don't find out, or oh no, I need to call my mom and dad. Right, that's what I want. I want my kids to be the ones that go, oh no, I need to call my mom and dad. And, and they have, and they do, and we're thankful for that, and we navigate those waters, right? You practice your poker face when they come to you with those questions. <laughs> you don't, you're freaking out on the inside, but the outside is, that's a great question, or wow. Let me think about that, I'm sorry that's happening. And then you go into what you thought was your private bedroom where no one could hear what you were talking about. <laughs> now we know we need to go into the garage and sit in the car in the garage. <laughs> um, and, and maybe even take a drive, but, yeah. but nonetheless, you know, you, you, you do that, you want them to know that they can come to you and I'll, I'll get back to you with, those an, with, those, with more information or we'll pray through it. And that's the other thing I would say too is we are regular prayers with our kids. When we don't know what to do, we will say, wait, oh, we need to stop and pray yeah, even with pray you for this. this. We're sorry you heard this word. We're sorry this happened to you. We're sorry this is happening to your friend, but let's bring Jesus into the equation right now because we are not equipped. We're human too, to handle this on our own. So that's one thing we've done as well. So we wanted to just touch upon that. So we're gonna transition into when do we start having these conversations about sex with our kids? So um, obviously you wanna start them as soon as possible. If you have babies in the room, uh, your babies in your, in your house, 
have those conversations. Now, again, it's going to be age appropriate, fitting their development and their maturity level. Obviously, like Sarah said, we're not talking about intercourse to a three-year-old or a five-year-old. Okay, that's, that conversation will happen much later. But we do, at a young age, want to start having conversations. So if you have kids between zero and three years old, you know, it's okay to start uh, referring to your bodies in the uh, correct anatomical <laughs> name, right? Okay, boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. I said it. I know, and Tommy hates church. those words. And, you know. can, and now that you've said it, it'll make people uncomfortable. We <laughs> maxed out our quota. So. You may say it two more times. Okay. <laughs> so, if you start using those words at a young age, you know, at this age, they're really not going to know, and, and they have no context to that word. That but, you're practicing, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you're practicing it to make it comfortable for yourself, but also it's everyday normal conversation, everyday words for them. Now, is it okay to have little code words uh, for, for those parts? Yes, absolutely, at this age. If you're not comfortable with it yet, you're still trying to wrap your brain around it, uh, I, uh, I taught PE at a middle school a few years ago, and those little uh, fi uh, kindergartners, they would, they, uh, I would tell them, hey, go sit on your bum bum, and they were also like, oh, he said bum bum, <laughs> you know, and they were cute, okay? Is it okay to, uh, you know, say, hey, uh, pee pee and wee wee at this age? Oh, of course or not, you know, it, of course it is. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but as I get a little older, and, and, and you want to start somewhere, just sprinkle those words into your everyday conversations. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite the little uh, books I read to the kids was that, uh, or the songs, that head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. So I, we, I would say that to them you know, hundreds of times when that age. And then, you know, as I got a little older, I kind of stopped in the middle and said, hey, this is your belly, uh, this is your butt, you know, and then mm -hmm. we just kind of incorporate some more words into that song. And so they already used to the song, and you just now kind of help include mm -hmm. some more vocabulary into that. So we actually have brought several resources with us today. When we were in Orange County last week, we stopped by Homeward, and we personally purchased a bunch of these books thinking we hate for anyone to leave. So if you're interested in any of the resources we're about to show you, we, we have them. You're welcome to reimburse us. Otherwise, we'll take them up and return them. No problem. Uh, but the first one is uh, God Made Your Body. And this one is specifically designed for three to five-year-olds. I'm going to read a piece of this. <laughs> yeah, right. This is just a, a, a great book uh, that Jim wrote. And it's very age-appropriate. And it just, uh, Sarah's going to read a couple, of, show you which we had on a slide, but we're going to show, uh, read, yeah. read it, and then... Uh Right, and it starts, and I love this because it starts at a young age, and when I was rereading this earlier this week, I thought, oh man, I remember trying to have these conversations with my kids. I love that it's in book form, <laughs> because then it becomes normal in your home. And I know someone was in here today, they said they have this book in their house. Was it, oh, you guys over here, I love it. And so they've already shared a fun story about this book. Um, you can talk to them <laughs> afterwards. But then when they're sharing it with a friend, but God made boys and God made girls, God made all shapes and sizes. He created all colors and languages. God made you. Those are the types of things we're talking about, but it doesn't shy away at, in, later in the book with, in, in some ways, boys' bodies and girls' bodies are different. And so even three to five, you're just talking about what the differences are in those bodies. Boys grow up to become men, and because they have these special parts, they can become daddies. So those are good things we want our kids to know. And because you already used those two words, I'm not going to read them in the book right now. <laughs> they're in the book. <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. At this age, again, they're going to ask some questions, and, uh, and they're going to just start uh, experimenting with stuff that they, uh, they aren't even aware that they're even doing. And, but be aware of, of what they're doing, and uh, don't freak out. We had a, a friend uh, while we were in Las Vegas. Uh, the preschool that we attended was right next to a park, and it was a, a great time to just pick up the kids and go hang out at the park for a few hours. One day, our friend's daughter came out of preschool and said, look, Daddy, what am I going to do with my finger? And she held up the middle, the middle finger. <laughs> I won't show it to you because I'm video. <laughs> and he freaked out. He pulled her to the side, and he, you can tell that he, he was very animated, and he was talking to her. Basically, he was telling her, don't ever use that. Don't, this, is, this is a bad thing. We don't ever do that to our friends. We don't never want to use that middle finger. When really, uh, in preschool, she would just, hey, look what, uh, they, they were teaching her how to, you can do the, what you can do with your finger. You can do the hang loose sign, you can do the peace sign, you can do, uh, you can snap your fingers, you know, and then just happened that somebody, hey, showed her that it's a middle finger. So she wasn't using the middle finger for the middle finger. She was just showing what she can do with her hands. So just understand where they're at when they're uh, showing you these things. 
moving on to the ages six, about six through nine, uh, it, we're talking about how God makes babies. And this is such a great age to start talking about that because lots of kids at this age and stage of life know, have friends who are, whose moms are pregnant or their own moms are. And so it's a great way to continue encouraging those conversations and answer some of the basic questions they have. So this particular book does cover those things which in, in a God-honoring way. Right, it's just some simple stuff, and like, do you know a family that's expecting a baby? And some great graphics, and it just moves on, and there's a scripture verse from Genesis 2, 24, and then it says, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. Again, age appropriate, starting a conversation. This is a lot more um, words than the previous book, but it's, uh, it's one of those things, again, just having those conversations. Again, if they do know somebody who is pregnant and expecting, it's a great way to kind of talk about body and development. We would, with our kids, when Keith was, when I was pregnant with Keith, the girls were curious. And so I actually had, I brought it with me today, a, a, the pregnancy week by week thing that I would have out and go through. And that was a good opportunity with our young daughters to walk through how, how mommy's body's changing. Those are good, healthy things. And, then, and when we talked about how sex is mysterious, it removes some of that mystery from it. Because really there's lots of anatomical things that you can just talk scientifically about with your kids. And it's not, and that doesn't have to be awkward. They understand and they're going to learn about science things so making sure that we've already talked about some of that stuff is really good yeah and but from the a question is standpoint. what do you do when your kid knows more than the other kid at school or on the playground yeah so if you <laughs> if you have a bright child and you've been having these conversations it is possible that one day your child will go up to another child and say hey you have a penis because you are a boy, and you have a vagina because you are a girl. And it's going to freak their parents out that those <laughs> words are being said to them. Okay? If that is your child, it is okay to, to remind them, hey, it is their parents' job to talk about that stuff, not your job to tell your friends about that. Right? We would, yeah, we would tell our kids, too, listen, we, we are the experts in the, fa in the house because and you are proof of that, that we know more than your eight-year-old friend does. So come to us, but don't take that information to them. We want their parents to have that conversation. Right. And so the next stage, as they get older, this is probably around 10 years or, or older, well, we want to kind of just talk about the purity code. Again, we're going to talk into each of those steps and the book about it. But, uh, you know, if they're not going through puberty on the outside, they are going through puberty on the inside, right? Um, hormones are kicking in that they've never had before. Emotions are coming up that they've never had before. And we want to be the place where when that happens to, to them, th that they can go for answers and they can go to have those conversations. So again, we want to break some of that mystery ahead of time in, in those earlier conversations, but this is a great time to kind of really uh, touch upon some of those, especially uh, pornography, which is a huge uh, risk in today's society. One of the things that we would say at this age, too, is it's always important to ask, why do you want to know? Or tell me more about that. Lucy, I think, referenced it when she said um, something to, oh, did she share that story? Where they would say, we would ask them, like, well, why don't you tell us what you think it means? We, you know, when, a, when a child comes to you and says, what is sex? And they're feeling they need to know M versus F on an application. It's very different than what is sex in the context of marriage, right? So we want to know that we're answering the right question. It's super important to ask them that. We want to know the deeper meaning behind the motivation for the question. And that's where you can find out things about friends or things that are happening in homes that they visit that you might want to know more information about. So it could be totally innocent or it could be not. Questions, 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 a rapid fire of them. Uh, is the most important thing. And then you get to the age of eight, 14 and older, and this is the nothing is um, off limits phase. You can talk about everything. And you know, what do I do if my kids ask about my sex life? What do I do when they embrace hard questions? And one of the things we've always said is, and, and we've talked with, with our kids and their friends, when those questions come up is, I'm always, again, why are you asking? Uh, I want to make sure that you're not holding me on a pedestal that I can't attain, because I will fall off of that. I also want to make sure you're not using my mistakes as an excuse to make your own. I want to know why you want to know. What's the motivation behind that question? And when I hear it, I'm then going to go back and pray about it, and then I'm going to have a follow-up conversation. I 99% of the time don't answer the question right then and there, because I really, really, really want to know why you want to know. My story is relatively an open book. I'm happy to share it, but if I sense that there's an ulterior motive, I'm um, going to hold back. 
you know, because uh, some of our stories are really hard, and we don't want to feel like we are now shamed by our kids, or they're using that as a weapon against us. At the same time, we don't want to swing a surprise on them later, where we pretended that we lived everything perfectly and didn't make any mistakes, and then, surprise! Yeah, we want to be authentic and real, uh, appropriately, with the stage of their life. Um, I've gone through, I have pains and regrets. We all have pains and regrets and things, you know, in our past that, you know, I wish I could have done differently. As I reflect back on my life now, I, I've come to the, uh, had this thought a couple of times, goes, man, I wish I had somebody to speak to my life right here or talk to me about this right here. I think, and I think I'd like to be, have been smart enough to say, I probably would have made a different decisions. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my life now. I, our marriage is great. I, our ki my kids are wonderful. Uh, we have great jobs. And my life right now is better than uh, anything I could have imagined. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. <laughs> right? But sometimes I think, man, if I, and this is something you would bring up if you have older kids. And it's like, you know, I, this is why I want to talk to you about this. Because I wish I had somebody to speak into my life about this at this time. And so, I, you know, if, if you will let me, I would like to talk to you about it today. And so, uh, I just want to talk to you if you have uh, older kids, right? Sometimes uh, we have situations where we have to discipline ourselves and, and kind of delay gratification. And I always ask myself, uh, would, I, would, would I rather have the pain of discipline or the pain of regret? I think Sarah mentioned that last week. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking like, yeah, my, my kids are older, I've kind of missed that boat, you know, I don't, you know I, I, we've never talked about it, and I don't know how to bring it up, and you're kind of feeling a little guilty about it, I'm going to encourage you, let go of that guilt, okay? Start that conversation. It's never too late to start that conversation. Uh, you know, and again, it's a, it doesn't have to be the talk, and you don't have to make, we don't want to make it awkward or weird, it, although it will be awkward, but we don't want to be preachy about it, we don't want to just, uh, uh, we want to make it positive, a positive conversation, and you can bring into, bring it up, let's like we, when we were watching TV or reading something, or even music, hey, did you hear the latest song about Pitbull? And it's like, yeah, which one is that? And then you talk about some of the lyrics that are in that, or did you see that, uh, even on the news, hey, did you, did you see what happened to Nip, Nipsey Hussle? Well, who's that? Uh, well, you know, it, it, was trend, it was a number one trended thing for a long time. And if you, if you don't know, Google it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great thing. Right. Okay, we want to move into the foundation of developing a healthy sexuality and just look at some scripture that we have because this can help us and some vocabulary words that we want, to, we want to go over. And the first one would be this, God created sex. Yeah, this is in your pamphlet. It's in your, yeah, in your handout. God created sex. And Genesis 2, 18 through 25 really tells us how God designed us and made us and Towards, I'm just going to read towards the end. It says, The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. You know, God created it, and so that makes it good. And it's not just good. It has no shame, right? And that leads us to the next verse. As God sees it, that's good. It's very good. It mm -hmm. says in Genesis 1, 26 and, 20, and 31, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them let rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. In 31, he says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. God, uh, sex is in your body. It's not just your gender, but it also is... Uh, that feeling that you have, God put it there. He, you were created in God's image, and he sees it as very good, and you created what they call Imago Dei. Mm -hmm. So quick vocabulary lesson, a few phrases that are good to know, um, and we're going to start with adultery. You know, God gave us this word way back in Exodus 20, 14, when he said, you shall not commit adultery, and there's a reason for this, because it's two people in a sexual relationship, and one or both of them are married, and that's a bad idea, to have a relationship with someone else when you are married. We just tell our kids that. It's not how God designed us. He's not trying to be a killjoy, like Keith put it, a buzzkill, <laughs> um, which I thought was awesome, um, but he's giving us boundaries to help our marriage, and this is a really good way to have a strong marriage, is to not participate in adultery. Yeah, not a good thing. Uh, next word is fornication. It's 1 Thessalonians um, 
First, first lesson on Thessalonians, Thessalonians. four three <laughs> is that the God uh, it is God's will that you should be that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality. Notice it doesn't say avoid sex. Okay, yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, <laughs> but avoid sexual immorality or fornication in this case. You want to be set apart, and that includes our bodies as well. Other words they'll hear is one flesh. That's basically God's design for marriage, one flesh. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 19. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Jesus is basically talking about sex. When you have sex, you are bound together. You become one person and it's not just your bodies, but it's your emotional state of being. It's your spiritual life that can be bound together. And it's really hard to separate that. We don't want to separate that. And that's why we encourage waiting for marriage to do that. Okay. And the, f- the final word is sexual purity. It comes in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sin a man commits are outside his body, but he who s- sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own, but you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. We wait because that's what God, God wants the best for us. Sin is sin, and we don't want to categorize which sin is worse than another sin, but uh, this one has a different, uh, there's a different con- set of consequences for sexual immorality. Where it says flee from immorality, it implies that there's a, there's a different consequence for this sin because it's a sin against your own body. Like we just said, you, uh, God has made your body. Your body is a temple, and the Holy Spirit lives within you, and, um, and which should motivate us and inspire us toward, a, toward making choices that are inclu- healthy choices, toward, and that include mm-hmm. healthy sexual integrity. Yeah. So that brings us back to that purity code, that sexual integrity code. We want to break that down and unpack that a little more for you. So the first one, like we said, is changes in the body. Right. And this, uh, this can't be a surprise. You know, it shouldn't <laughs> be a surprise that they, all our children will go through puberty, right? Guys and girls' bodies will change. Uh, again, we want to be the safe person for when they have those awkward situations, awkward moments, when they're dealing with feelings and emotions that they've never had before, and how to healthily, uh, in a positive way, in a healthy way, kind of address some of those. Yeah, I think the other thing is, too, is to honor our kids through those. As our bodies change through middle school, or late uh, elementary and middle school years, it can be embarrassing. You know, you see uh, kids dress differently because they're unsure how to navigate what that looks like in their own homes, but also within a friend realm as well. It's the time where all of a sudden kids go from summer camp to, you know, in cabins when they're little, they don't care if they change in from each other, to the line is out the door for the bathroom, you know, just to put your pajamas on. There's this whole mystery going on, and they, we don't want them to be afraid of that. The other thing I'd say is, when, as you're being honoring of them, is to consider where social media fits into your life. I recently read a post on social media that said, my daughter started her period today. Wow. Right? Wow, that should be our response. Right? How is that okay? Let me say, it is not okay. That was so dishonoring of that daughter. Now she's no longer a safe person publicly, right? So we want to be really careful what we're posting of our kids. And I would say it's not even just blatant comments like that, but even what they're wearing or not wearing when they're little could make a big difference. They don't have a choice when they're little what you post. Right? I don't post anything of my kids without them knowing first, especially at this stage of life, right? That's their business. I can post about myself and tell my own story, but I'm pretty sure this daughter wouldn't want that posted on social media for the whole world to know. Right, and at this stage, you know, we kind of want to be prepared to kind of talk about things that, uh, like we found out uh, when our kids were going to have their sex education in public school. It's like, wow, we didn't know we were going to talk about that. So there are some things that will pop up in this area, uh, like masturbation, right, self-gratification. What are you going to say if you have a son who is going through this phase? Studies show 92% of males have done it. The other 8% are lying about it. 
So. <laughs> you would know better than me. <laughs> That's true. Um, the other thing we want to talk about when it comes to their bodies is, is sex safe? There are sexually transmitted diseases out there, and there are some staggering statistics when it comes to what those are, and our kids need to know about those. We need to make sure that they understand what those are. Yeah, Newsweek magazine had a study a, a few years back that college age students, one in five college age students has a sexually transmitted disease, and they have at least seven partners. So you do the math. That's a lot of dangerous stuff out there. Yeah. Then there's the emotional effects of sex outside of marriage. Those are listed in your book, but guilt, regret, fear, depression, worry, those all come alongside of having sex outside of marriage. Don't we, I mean, those things exist without having sex in the equation outside of marriage. So let's try to help them not add that into their baggage. We will often hear people say they have regrets of having premarital sex. You rarely hear someone who waited say, oh, I really regret that I didn't have sex before marriage. If only I'd had yeah. sex before marriage, my marriage would be better. You don't ever hear that. Never hear that. So uh, the next point of the a purity code is the mind. The mind is the most important sex organ. It's not, your, the, the, it's not the genitalia. It's actually your mind. In this stage, we want to talk about radical respect. Again, we're not, we don't have friends with benefits. Uh, we're not just dating someone because they're cute, because they're nice, or they're good looking, or they have a nice car, or they dress well. Right? The, we're dating a person for the long term and who, who is somebody created in God's image who uh, we, we want to be honoring to because they have parents and, and they have a family. So at this stage, we want to just make sure uh, that they understand that it's not just the physical it's also the internal. Yeah, within their minds too, I think we've, we try to make sure that we are giving them information that's helpful. So honoring the opposite gender. You know, we do talk about how guys, uh, we, we talk about this with our girls, like, listen, we do want you to be thoughtful with what you wear, not just with us because we think uh, that, that modesty. skirts, modesty is a good thing, but because guys are designed to think you're good looking and you don't need to dress certain ways to get their attention, that they're just designed to do that. We've taught our son, listen, we want respect for women in our lives that matters to us. Uh, one of the things I've loved is even secular shows like What Not to Wear. That was a, such a gift to us when our girls were little because those, that's a secular view of why you dress modestly. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's great. We can talk about that and we can talk about why that outfit wasn't a good choice or, or what we could do to be honoring. It really, it is about honoring self, right? Honoring God, family, self, and, um, and each other and our future spouse. And so that's why we bring these topics into play and it starts in our mind. Yeah, so in your booklet, you're gonna see a chart called the age of, uh, the age of dating chart. And uh, it's kind of self-explanatory that the younger you start dating, right, the greater chance that, uh, that you'll have sexual intercourse before graduating high school. And it makes, more, it makes sense, as you, if you delay that, and you, you tend to be more mature, and again, you've hopefully had some conversations, and that you've set some boundaries, set some goals, mm -hmm. and you follow through uh, with that. So the later you start, the, the greater your chances are of not having sexual intercourse uh, before high school. And uh, even Christian studies have shown that kids uh, who are involved in church, their percentage is actually better in some of those characters. Not huge, but it's better. Mm -hmm. The third one is eyes. We are going to, um, the dangers of our eyes can get, they can get us in trouble, what we're looking at and what we're seeing. Right, and this is uh, in the area of pornography. Pornography is prolific in today's uh, society. Along with the uh, prime time innuendos, there is a danger of pornography and it affects both male and female, right? The number one viewers of porn are boys 12 to 17. Number two is girls 12 to 17. And then number three are males 18 to 25. That one makes more sense than the first two. Uh, once you start viewing pornography, those images stay in your head, and it, which leads to an escalation and just progression of being addicted to pornography. After, you do, after someone has viewed those images, your mind wants more of them and in greater variety. That's the, uh, that's the danger of pornography. It, you're not just satisfied with the same image. You have to have other types of images, which leads to addiction. Right? Addiction, you can't just get your mind out of it anymore. And pornography, it's way too easy to have access in this day and age. It's on every device. Even if you have some sort of parental control, uh, 
kids are really smart. And if, uh, if your kid doesn't know, I bet you he's got a friend, he or she has a friend who does know how to get around some of those parental controls. Well, at my age, when, when I was growing up, you know, my first naked woman that I saw was in National Geographic magazine, all right? Uh, and then uh, friends told me, hey, uh, if you want to you know, uh, go a little bit further, uh, go to the 7-Eleven, right? It's behind the counter. But it was behind the counter. I had to ask somebody for it if I wanted that stuff. Not that I did. Uh, <laughs> and it was wrapped in like a brown paper bag, or so you couldn't even see what it was. But nowadays, you click on the wrong thing. Even innocently, you'll get images. You go, whoa, that's shocking. And we would tell our kids that too. Like, listen, if you're ever you know, Google searching something for school and something crazy pops up, make sure you tell us because we want to make sure we keep you safe. And then let us do the research on, okay, what's going on here? Is there, A, something wrong on our computer? Did they, you know, is it a search word that we need to make sure we tell them don't ever type this search word in because that type of stuff will pop up? Really validating and praising them for bringing it to us is so important. All right. And the next step is just escalation. You know, again, your mind wants more. And uh, what was once shocking you know, when, when Johnny or Julie types in a word, and they're all, oh, yeah. And they keep going. It's no longer shocking. It's just normal now. And the next uh, stage is desensitization, right? What uh, is no longer unusual is it, now it shows up in the way they dress, in the way they talk, uh, in, the, in their actions, in their opinions, and mm -hmm. sometimes in the way they treat other people, treat the opposite mm -hmm. sex. Yeah. We've had two different friends who have struggled with this in their marriages. One, it completely wrecked the marriage. Um, the, she, he could not or would not stop his porn addiction. And that it wrecked their boys, it wrecked their family. And I can remember thinking, this is no joke. We cannot mess around with this. We have another couple, they are still married, but they will be in forever counseling. His reality and um, expectation of what sexual gratification looks like was skewed from viewing pornography. He could, just could not get over that. And so they've had to navigate that their entire marriage. You know, I want my kids not to have to navigate that in their marriage. I want them to be, have successful, fun encounters, not be um, navigating those waters. We've told our kids, listen, this is someone's son or daughter stuck in an industry or doing things that are not good for them. That's someone's son or daughter that you're looking at. And our sons and daughters are looking at this now and you're harming them. It is no joke. When you come across it, we have to nip it in the bud. We have to make sure that we're part of the solution and helping not just our own children, but their friends and their classmates to try to get away from this. Yeah, when they get to the last stage where they're acting out sexually, that means they're trying to imitate or copy what they're seeing in, the, in these pictures or videos. And that's fake. It's traumatic, and it's definitely not what God intended. Uh, we were told about a couple who went through, uh, through counseling, right? And the, the wife brought up the, uh, something that the husband had said, and she said, my husband thinks uh, we should watch porno pornography because it would spice up our sex life. And so the counselor asked the husband, so how long have you been watching pornography? And he had to admit in front of his wife for the first time that he's been watching porn since the sixth grade. So it is something we uh, definitely, uh, again, we don't want to scare you. We just want to uh, inform you that it's out there. And if you, your children uh, are, aren't involved in it now, somewhere out there, they have a friend, they have a classmate, they have mm -hmm. a schoolmate who may be in, is. The final one is our hearts. We need to practice guarding our hearts. This is where we handle our emotions, uh, we practice grace and forgiveness, we're developing he healthy self-image, and this is where we have hope, right? It's within our heart. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us about our heart, however. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know, you can follow your heart, but you have to take your brains with you. <laughs> and we need to make sure that they go together. You can't have one without the other. You can find yourself in a space you don't want. Remember, our goal is to help develop healthy sexuality that honors God, family, future spouse, and ourself. You know, our, our genders are different. They're designed amazingly by God. We are uniquely created, and that's why we make our goals. That's why we set a code. And what we need to make sure we're doing is that we're following those ourselves as well. This is my goal. I want to remember to have my sexuality honor God first, my family. I want it to honor Tommy, and I want it to be honoring to myself. I want to set the tone for my family so that my kids have something that they can, they can model their lives after hopefully in a good way. 
Yeah, we're not, uh, we're not raising obedient kids. Uh, we want to raise responsible adults. And I think we also need to talk about uh, their sexuality in a healthy and positive way. So, uh, and there are going to be differences, right? Boys and girls are different. So you're going to have to kind of know where, what your, your child uh, hot points are and, and how to talk to them and what their maturity level is. Uh, but it's, again, we want to encourage you to just start having those conversations.